Welcome to another MS Views and News program. All right, and we're here tonight with Dr. Crystal Legank. This is a Compass 2 MS Care event. My name is Stuart Schlossman, President and Founder of MS Views and News. Tonight's sponsors, we have EMD Serono and Genentech. Okay, and um, again, this is a Compass to MS Care event. We have Dr. Chris Legank, who has been treating multiple sclerosis for over 22 years at the Joanne P. Legank MS Center in Coleman, Alabama. All right, and um, we are going to be, well, you see the, the topics of tonight's program. It's on the screen right now. Dr. Legang put together quite a, an extensive PowerPoint, got lots of pictures in there, and um, it's got scenes of where he was in Europe. I mean, I recognize one of them right away, La Familia Grata, right? <laughs> La Familia Sagrada, yeah. yeah. I don't say it right, exactly, but uh, I, you know, I got MS, I can't remember. All right, but anyway, I know where it was. It's very easy to find once you're there. And uh, it's an awesome site. So in the meantime, let's welcome Dr. Legank and let's get this program started, okay? Great. Great, thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Um, thank you all for attending this evening. I'm so glad to have the opportunity to speak with you. Always like it in person, but um, these are the times and I guess I can reach a greater audience uh, at this time um, by going through the web. So um, again, thanks for attending and hopefully you'll uh, Get a good bit of information. So I'm going to start out before the actual agenda part with a couple of pearls or things that I think are really important to take home and why we're here in the first place. So, you know, why are we talking about MS? Why do we? Why do? Why does Stu do, do what Stu does? Um, well, it's because this is a very uh, prominent condition. MS number one disabling neurological uh, condition in the world for young and middle-aged adults. Um, and as we see on the next slide, that um, untreated MS is fatal statistically. So about seven years lost life kind of on average uh, for someone who does not treat the MS. Um, so we have a window of opportunity, however, because it says that untreated is the key word there. And we have several studies over the past two decades that show with treatment, life expectancy is normal. So very important to um, treat this as best we can and, and normalize life expectancy. So um, first off is something that I deal with all the time in clinic um, is something that happens in chronic illness. So someone who has a chronic illness often feels a burden. So they feel like they're a burden um, to others or they're very frustrated not um, doing what they thought they would be doing 10 years earlier, let's say. And so, um, in fact, though, if we look at it in a different way, you're, you have an opportunity to be a huge inspiration to others. So it's kind of what you do with what you got. And so um, inspirations kind of work with a good attitude and gratitude. That's that's how you inspire other people. So if you do the thing you do um, with a, a smile and if you're spiritual and attribute it to the Lord above, that moves people. Um, I have an example of a person who was in the supermarket <clears throat> and a um, person uh, obviously had MS and was using a, a um, cart to get a, through the supermarket and was struggling you know, physically, but smiling, good attitude. There was someone in the aisle who was really having a bad day <clears throat> and um, he kind of noticed her go by, but that's about the limit of it, went home and he was just not doing well. And he filled uh, his hand with the pills from a bottle and he was ready to end it all. And as he poured it out, her image came to his head and he said, what am I doing? He said, that lady who obviously has a lot of challenges in life had a good attitude and was, you know, moving forward in life and didn't keep her down. What am I doing? He threw his pills away um, and went back to the supermarket and got word back to her. Someone knew how to reach her, who, who she was, and let her know that she saved his life that day. And she saved his, his life that day because of how she acted with what she had. So she had a disability and she inspired the world, basically. So I have a few slides here. Um, never ignore somebody with a disability. You don't realize how much they can inspire you. So that's 
kind of that example. It's, it's, uh, it's amazing how often I hear that. I hear people who come to the clinic in the waiting area and they say, if I ever have a bad day, I just need to come to your office and I can be inspired so much by people who really, you know, um, carry on with against, against certain odds. So um, although a person with MS who may have some challenges is not doing the thing that they had thought life was supposed to be, well, you have an opportunity to move people more than any speech I could give um, because you live it. So um, <clears throat> it's really important to have an attitude of, I'm not a burden, I have an opportunity. I have an opportunity to inspire other people by carrying on with what, with what I have. So in the next uh, couple of slides, the only disability in life is a bad attitude. You can see a surfer there who has a physical challenge. And next. People will always look at you the way you look at yourself. So that's something really to, to ponder and, and, and let it sink in. People will always look at you the way you look at yourself. Uh, I had a patient in today dressed in black, okay, and she's depressed. And I'll see that. It doesn't mean that if you wear black, you're depressed by any means. But people who are in a deep depression or who feel rather depressed, um, a lot of times they'll wear a dark color. I say, what, what else is in your closet? Well, black and black and black and dark blue and so on. And it's just sort of kind of befits how a person's feeling about themselves and about life. So you know, I encourage some people who are that way to get that that pink or that orange or that light blue or aqua shirt out and put it on even if you're feeling kind of down because what you see otherwise is something bright and cheery and it can really uh, change your attitude. So this person here on this film is my mom. So she was my inspiration and she was hit really hard with this condition. <clears throat> so I never knew her to walk normal my whole life. So age two, three, start to be aware of life and she's struggling, falling, people staring, um, soiling herself uh, in the dental chair or in the car, you know, and, and always had a, you know, as best an attitude as she can, as she could. And that was really, you know, later on in life, I didn't appreciate it when I was young, but when I was older, that really helped me through some very difficult times was that uh, how much courage she had um, to face all the obstacles that she did. Uh, in her life that, that MS kind of posed for her. Uh, but if you think that your disability can't inspire people, <clears throat> the only reason I went into medicine was because of her. And so I've seen uh, well over 100,000 unique patients in my career. Um, I've traveled the world um, teaching other clinicians and patients about MS. I've been in over 70 uh, clinical trials for MS and see many patients every week still. And all of that is because of that lady's disability, if you'll call it that. So she inspired me to do all that and touched a lot of people in my life. And you can as well. It's what you do with what you got. Um, I guess is the phrase I would use. So instead of false burden bearing, <clears throat> we need to get past that. And another thing that is often stated in clinic is, well, I feel like such a burden, you know, he or she didn't sign up for this and they could be doing so many other things if they didn't have to tend to these aspects of my life and so on. And my, my usual response to that is, oh, so if he or she was in your shape, you would think they were a burden, right? And they say, oh, no, 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 they wouldn't be a burden to me. Oh, so you're better than they are, um, that you wouldn't feel burdened, but they would. And then they're like, well, no, no, I don't think it's usually some stammering going on. And it's not that way. You know, your team, your team, you and your um, spouse or caregiver or family, whoever's involved in the care, no, they're teammates. And if one's down, you pick them up. And if you were down, if you're down, they pick you up. Uh, it's no different. And like I said, there's lots of opportunities to inspire people despite what your, you know, any sort of physical limitations that you might have. 
So challenges are opportunities. If you look at it as an opportunity to move things forward on this planet, I think um, your perspective of where you're at and what you can do changes a whole lot. So now we're gonna get into kind of the agenda of the program. And first thing I'm gonna talk about is symptom management <clears throat> and then into some of the new and future treatment options. I could spend days on that aspect of, of MS. And then benefits of clinical trials, if you're considering that. Um, accessing resources and specialists, especially in a pandemic. And how to communicate optimally with um, your healthcare team. So we'll start with um, kind of treatment of MS. And if we look at medical treatment of MS, I, I think of it in really three broad boxes. The first box is treating relapses or attacks or inflammation, and that generally entails steroids or ACTH or IVIG or um, uh, plasmapheresis treatments such as that. And that's to get rid of active inflammation. <clears throat> then second box is kind of the staple treatment. So that's the treatment you take to control MS to keep yourself from getting worse, additional lesions in the brain spinal cord. Um, that's whether that's primary progressive, primary progressive or relapsing forms of the condition. And once we're kind of through that, we've controlled a relapse and in, or inflammation, and we're on a staple medication for MS, then um, the third box is quality of life. So with the things that you have to contend with MS, um, how can we affect quality of life? And that's really where we play most of the time in clinic. We can get on a, a very good medication to control progression of disease, then we have uh, a opportunity to try to take care of fatigue and other symptoms that we'll see in a minute. So that's, that's quality of life box. And as I had a patient today, <clears throat> new patient to me who had something called pseudobulbar affect and just kind of blurts out laughter. And it seems a little awkward, doesn't really bother the patient at all. Um, and it's better than the other aspect, usually it was just sudden crying and uncontrollable crying, but he had just the laughter component. And just because he had the symptom didn't mean, and we have a treatment for it, doesn't mean he should take it. So I call it the quality of life box and not the symptom box, because you can have a symptom that really doesn't adversely affect your quality of life and you don't necessarily um, consider treating that. Now, if he was crying all the time, couldn't function, and um, had a lot of adverse um, social interactions because of that sudden crying, then that might be something he would consider um, to treat. But uh, so we're gonna go through um, MS symptoms and, um, and uh, broadly, and then each kind of uh, several of them and uh, different sort of treatment options that we might have. So MS symptoms really vary from individual to individual, and they vary both in occurrence and in severity. Uh, so the saying is when you've met one person with MS, you've met one person with MS, <clears throat> because nobody's exactly the same based on your life history and then your MS. A lot of times there are shared symptoms and you can identify with um, symptoms that other patients may have, but your walk is your walk. And, um, and we know how to treat symptoms, but we want to put it in the context of, of your life and where you're at. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about medications, and this is really based on my experience, not necessarily on FDA recommendations for symptom treatment, because frankly, there probably are not any um, uh, symptom management medications that are FDA approved specifically for an MS symptom, stated as an MS symptom. Uh, so <clears throat> um, treating symptoms does not play in the second box, which was your staple medication to control new lesion formation. So treatment of symptoms is not likely going to affect the occurrence of new lesions, um, but um, it's designed to improve quality of life. So when you take a medication for a symptom, you want to ask, is the cost the adverse side effect, the interactions, the frequency of taking this balanced with the benefit that I derive in balance is my quality of life improved. And if so, then I think it's probably a worthwhile 
treatment. If not, then um, probably not. Uh, so we're going to uh, concentrate on the pharmacological side of treatment of these symptoms. There are many, many um, non-pharmacological um, aspects to treating um, these conditions. I might mention a couple of those, but but uh, just for time's sake, I'm going to mention um, broadly the kind of uh, medications that you have at your behest, at least to have knowledge about it, so that if that's something you want to treat, you can discuss that with your healthcare provider. So listed here is a bunch of symptoms. I'm not going to read them all, um, and I'm going to go over um, each of these um, subsequently, but uh, a bunch of symptoms, and many of them are what we call hidden symptoms. So symptoms that nobody can really see. You feel them. No one can see your type of fatigue. No one can see your pain or understand your anxiety or depression necessarily directly. You can see um, secondarily some of those manifestations of the symptoms, but they don't know what it feels like on the inside. So we're gonna go forward and start out with fatigue. <clears throat> so MS-related fatigue is the most common side effect of MS. Between 75 and 95% of people will complain or have fatigue as a symptom during their um, journey with MS. And it's the number one disabling symptom of MS, the one that people get onto disability for the most. So it's not being paralyzed on one side or in, in a wheelchair or being blind in an eye. It's fatigue that is the number one reason people gain disability with this condition. Major reason for unemployment causes are um, definitely multifactorial, uh, multifactorial. And uh, maybe one of the most frustrating parts of MS fatigue is, is uh, people who don't have this condition and um, they don't understand it very well, especially early on in the course. So more about fatigue. <clears throat> um, uh, well, first is a picture. So my son is on the right there, and that's him just finishing uh, running his first and only marathon in Huntsville, Alabama that day with his uh, cross-country buddy. Uh, they both ran the marathon. So that kind of fatigue is a physical fatigue that we understand. And we see someone who finishes a marathon, we go, oh, I bet you're tired and you're going to rest well tonight, et cetera. That's not the kind of fatigue we're talking about with MS. <clears throat> so MS fatigue can be in many different forms. So one is just kind of malaise or lassitude or lassitude, just lack of energy, just like all the stuffing's been taken out. So it's not like I haven't slept for days and my I have bags under my eyes. That's pretty obvious to see. But it's more, I just don't have any gas left. And when you look at somebody that way, they don't necessarily appear tired. So it's hard for caregivers, friends, acquaintances to understand that fatigue. And we all kind of make judgments when we look at people. Um, we can't interview everybody how they're feeling. So you look at someone and you make an assessment, they look tired, they don't look tired. So when someone says, I'm, I'm really tired, I'd love to go do this, but I'm tired. Some people don't get that. There's a mismatch between how a person appears and actually what they're telling you. And so that leads to a lot of strife um, until that's understood. Um, there is also the sleepiness and that can occur in people who don't sleep very well, <clears throat> which is a really pretty common in MS sleep disorders are. And then there's weakness or fatigability. So if you um, start out to the mailbox and then halfway there, boy, the leg's given out. It's really tired and it just can't go anymore. That's not um, MS fatigue, what we call MS fatigue, but that's fatigability. So that's motor fatigability because the wiring that's going to the legs has a certain amount of juice. And once it runs through that scar of MS enough times, not much signal goes forward. That leg's not moving. It's fatigable. Rest 15, 20 minutes, then you can walk some again. Uh, so those are different aspects of fatigue or what people describe with fatigue and MS. <clears throat> so what correlates with MS how, or with MS fatigue? What can we look at and say, you have a higher chance of having fatigue with your MS if you have this? Well, age is not a correlate. Sex is not a correlate. How long you've had the disease does not correlate with your fatigue. And many, many MRI measures have not been shown to correlate with um, MS fatigue. Only depression um, has a positive correlation with fatigue. Now that's not saying that you have to have depression to have MS fatigue. It just says if you're a person with MS and has and you have depression, 
likely there is going to be MS fatigue um, present as well. <clears throat> so is MS fatigue distinct? Well, we think it's pretty distinct from other types of fatigue that we may experience in our life. There's a heat sensitivity and a lot of people, you know, with MS, they'll just wilt when exposed to heat. It can be a warm shower. For, you just have a warm shower, have to rest before you can go forward. My mom, for example, with her MS, um, when it became summer and she was exposed to the heat, she'd be paralyzed from the waist down. And I have to bear hug her and unfortunately drag her legs up the stairs to get into the house to the one room where we had an air conditioner so that she could cool off back in the 60s and 70s. Um, and so she was uniquely sensitive to the heat, that, that sort of fatigue. And in general, we don't see that. Yes, if we're out in 100 degrees and we're mowing the lawn, we feel fatigued, but it's a different kind of uh, fatigue than the heat sensitivity that people with MS experience. Often the fatigue will predate other MS symptoms. So if you say, well, it's due to the spasticity or it's due to um, motor weakness or something else, well, a lot of times fatigue is the very first symptom in MS before any of that's evident. The MS fatigue can vacillate. So you can have good times and bad times. That's really important in clinical trials because if a person comes in for a visit in the morning and the, the, for one visit and then comes in the afternoon the next time, well, maybe the motor exam is going to be a little worse. Maybe their score on their EDSS for MS is going to be worse, and they're not really worse. It's not that the medication or whatever's being tested is not working. It's that they were tested late at a different time in the day, so you're comparing apples to oranges. <coughs> Excuse me. And then that relationship that I talked about with depression just kind of says maybe because depression and fatigue are also um, intimately related. So maybe there's some kind of common neural substrate uh, that works when someone has depression and works when someone has MS. That's something to be determined. Just briefly, not going into any of this with any detail, but just for kind of nerdy facts or nerdy things to think about. Possible mechanisms of this fatigue, well, it could be dysregulation of the immune system, and that leads to this energy uh, mismatch. It can be the hypothalamic pituitary axis or neuroendocrine pathway, you know, the pituitary gland, hypothalamus, adrenal gland axis. Um, it can be physiological or mechanical where um, it takes a lot more energy for a person to transmit a neural signal across scarred tissue. You have to move three molecules of ATP for every sodium potassium channel that you have to open. And if you have a bare wire, then you have to go through a lot of, of sodium potassium channels. Whereas if you have insulation or myelin that's fully intact, you jump from one node to the next and save a lot of energy. So just, just transmitting um, can cause a lot of energy loss. Um, and then Neuroanatomically, um, there are several different ways that um, we can look at um, uh, fatigue. This, the wakeful circuit you know, it goes from brainstem all the way up to the prefrontal area, and there are other circuits that are responsible for wakefulness and energy that may be affected as listed there. Autonomic dysregulation, so a lot of people will have swelling in the most affected MS limb. Usually it's swollen, cold, and a little bit purplish. And uh, it's because of, there's this auto autonomic dysregulation and pooling of blood, and that can kind of change energy uh, movement in the body. And then spasticity. Spasticity can cause um, uh, a lot of energy utilization. If your muscles are really tight and stiff, um, like you're working out all day long because of the spasticity, you're chewing up energy and, and not, you don't have energy um, for other things. So here's a picture. Um, so it's, again, speaking of you know how much my mom blessed me and and how disability um, impacts a person. Well, I had an opportunity to go to Prague and and to um, give some talks um, uh, for MS, and and this is one of the famous churches and uh, the, the picture to the right. It was, it was something that just caught me um, in the window. It says NC State, and I'm like, I'm over here in Prague. I went to UNC. I'm really not a fan of NC State, and there's NC State staring at me. So just thought that was kind of odd and would include that in, in uh, that picture. So moving forward, other causes of fatigue. You know, so this is not direct MS 
cause of fatigue, having a temperature, having a fever um, will cause fatigue to be worse. Um, poor sleep, the spasticity, as I mentioned, if you have a UTI, fatigue is usually much, much worse. Whereas some individual who doesn't have any other medical problem and has a UTI, the, the fatigue is not anything like the fatigue that's brought on in a person with MS. Anxiety chews up a lot of energy, drains the battery, leads to worse fatigue, um, depression as well, um, as I mentioned before, and then stress in general also will chew up energy and the MS fatigue is going to be a bit worse. So um, I spent a lot of time on this symptom because this is a very um, important symptom in this condition, important to understand and, and for patients and especially also for caregivers who may not understand what fatigue is about in MS because a person doesn't look tired and yet they're saying they have fatigue. So this can be a primary symptom of MS. It's influenced by many other factors that go on in life that, that also drain your battery has a significant impact on quality of life and function of life. We don't know the mechanism of action, uh, but it may be just direct energy transmission and pathways. Could be something I didn't discuss, which is mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, uh, they're the powerhouse of cells and, and they're altered underneath demyelinated areas inside the axon. And then you want to be aware of those that list of things that I just mentioned, what can worsen your fatigue and how can we manage those and try to prevent those from worsening our fatigue. All right, so pharmacotherapy is effective, especially on the short-term management of fatigue. Long-term, we, we need to have some strategies though. We need to be educated about it. What are the things that make it worse? Um, how do we conserve energy? Well, if I want to go outside and tend to the garden a little bit or, or do something outside. I'm not going to do it in the um, 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. time when the heat is the worst. Um, uh, my exercise, I need to improve uh, my exercise because the better shape I'm in, the less energy it takes me to do anything. So let that sink in a minute. If you're tired, you're like, well, okay, how am I going to exercise? Um, that's I don't have any energy to begin with. Well, if you gradually start to exercise, so let's say you have some ability to, to ambulate, well, ambulate for three to five minutes and do that for a week or two, then add a minute and keep going. It's, you're not going to get there tomorrow, but you're going to get there and you're going to improve stamina. And like I said, if a muscle is in better shape, the amount of energy it takes for a contraction is a lot less. It's in better tone. So if our whole body is out of shape, um, then everything we do costs us more energy than if we're in more shape. So ultimately, this is again a long-term management goal, to work on trying to get into shape. And if we don't have the use of the legs, well, then we can do air boxing maybe if we have our arm ability. There are things that we can do depending upon what abilities we have. <clears throat> and, and just in general, you know, we all have good days and bad days. So there's a good MS day and a bad MS day, let's say. And if you're feeling really fatigued, just don't have a lot in the tank, well, that's a smell of the roses. Hey, I woke up, I had a bed. I had sheets. I had a spouse or somebody next to me. I had family in the house. I have heat and, and I have cooling ability and I have food and water, a car, gas in the tank. I have some money in the wallet, maybe hopefully in the bank. I have you know, all the blessings that you have. And maybe it's more of a, I'm going to smell the roses day and I'm going to count my all the blessings I have today. And then when you, you're on it, then it's like, okay, now I am going to do the things I can do. I'm going to build buildings today. Now, don't overbuild and then be wiped out the next day. But the broad sense is some days you have it and you can kind of be on it. And other days, don't don't uh, be wistful of, oh, I wish I was building today. It's like, no, oh, look, I'm going to look around and, and be feel really um, grateful that I have the things that I have. <clears throat> so with the MS fatigue, um, again, this is sort of summarizes um, things that we can work on. We can work on the sleep. We can work on metabolic and medication aspects. So some medicines make you tired. So we need to be aware of, hey, maybe I have more fatigue because I'm on this medication or that medication. Or maybe I have B12 deficiency or thyroid disease. I'm not, I'm not immune from that because I have MS. It doesn't mean I can't get some other condition that commonly causes fatigue in adults. Um, maybe my depression and anxiety is not well treated. That's 
causing my MS fatigue to be worse. Uh, maybe I'm in, in the heat too much and need to cool it down a little bit. Maybe, you know, in the house, um, uh, spouse likes it a little bit um, warmer. Well, maybe we can cool it down and they can put, you know, something, uh, some additional clothing on so I can, I can be in a cooler environment. And then I talked about exercise. So the medications we have for fatigue, you know, are, are New Vigil, Pro Vigil, or Modafinil, Armodafinil. Amantadine or Symmetril, <clears throat> um, stimulants, so Adderall, Ritalin, Vyvanse, those kind of medications. Uh, some of the antidepressants can give more energy, more so the SNRIs than the SSRIs, but both have been shown to help some people have a good bit more energy, not just from the treating the depression, but also just in and of themselves. <clears throat> and then Dalfampridine uh, or Empyra, which can help with the fatigability uh, of various functions. So those are agents that we have for potentially for fatigue. Now this is a, a picture of uh, Thessaloniki in northern Greece. Uh, so I was uh, blessed to go uh, speak to the Greece um, neurology annual meeting and talk about MS. And this is a view from up top of Thessaloniki where Paul um, actually spoke in Thessalonians in the Bible. Uh, and those are olive trees right in front. And uh, across the water there is uh, Mount Olympus, which is, of course, um, famous in Greek mythology for Zeus's home. And uh, so there's some mountains over there. So a beautiful place that I had an opportunity to go and speak. <clears throat> Next symptom, dizziness and vertigo. A very under-recognized symptom in MS and is not classified if you had a bout of vertigo for a couple of days, that's not really classified as a relapse. It's not felt to be relapse worthy, I guess, um, because so many different things can cause and it's just not well appreciated um, as an attack um, of MS, but it can be. And, and, and it's amazing to see people who start out who were diagnosed with MS and say, well, well, I had a bout of vertigo or dizziness back two years ago that lasted this long and I was treated for labyrinthitis or inner ear and got better because the treatments that treat MS-related vertigo and dizziness are the same medicines that we use to treat um, those conditions I just mentioned. So <clears throat> the treatments are the meclizine or anavert, scopolamine patch behind the ear, steroids, um, and then <clears throat> benzodiazepines like clonopin or Valium on the short haul and antihistamines, all those are potential treatments for the vertigo or dizziness that may occur. Um, there are other reasons though, and just like in MS, we don't wanna blame everything on MS. So a person with MS may have inner ear or may have a different issue, may have a stone in the, in the inner ear and have benign positional vertigo. So we wanna be wary and not just uh, blame MS right out the gate if you have already had the diagnosis of MS, it still could be something else. And if we're not getting better, then um, seek help from uh, our ENT friends. <clears throat> so this is a stairwell in Park Guell in Barcelona, <clears throat> uh, Spain. So I've been there a couple times um, and uh, I love that city. Um, and we'll get another picture of it in a little bit, but uh, um, a great park on the top of Barcelona. <clears throat> So speech dysfunction and cognitive issues, about 40% of individuals with MS will have some sort of speech um, dysfunction. Uh, a scanning type of a dysarthria is the most common. So it, it's something like this, an automatic speech. So the fluidity is somewhat affected. And then there are people who have a decreased power. They just can't get enough to generate um, uh, a good um, uh, quantity of voice. Um, sometimes these symptoms are responsive to antispasticity medications um, as, as shown there. And sometimes the, tre the um, speech dysfunction is tremulous. It's a tremor type thing. And indrol sometimes can be helpful for something like that. Botox is not mentioned, but Botox can also help sort of vocal cord tremor or, or dystonia or some kind of tremulousness of voice. Other things um, about speech are word production. So our word, uh, um, the actual finding of the right words, what we call word anomia. So you're trying to come up with 
a word uh, and you just, you know what you want to say, but you can't come up with it because you form it in the prefrontal area of the brain and it can't get back to the um, utterance area of the brain or the motor portion of the brain because an MS scars in the way. So you know what you want to say and it's just circling there. It can't get through to the vocalization area and, um, and it can be quite frustrating. And then thought blocking is very similar. You have a thought, um, you're on track thinking about something, you're talking about it with somebody and then all of a sudden it hits that roadblock and it vanishes and the electrical signal dies and it's like, I don't know what I was talking about. So these are really common in MS. They happen for people who don't have MS for sure, but, but really very, very common. Some people um, who have this think they have a memory problem. Am I getting Alzheimer's? I can't remember the words. I, I, I get lost in my thinking. That's really not anything to do with the pathways in the temporal lobe, which is the memory portion of the brain. So it's really not a memory problem. It's a speech pathway problem. <clears throat> and then difficulty in multitasking, um, short-term memory difficulties, decision-making, those uh, are aspects of cognition that are affected. And that, that can be a whole talk as well about the cognitive difficulties with MS. You know, if you, it takes you longer to process complex information and you have problems with attention span because an MS brain is like an ADD brain a lot of times. If you, it takes you longer to understand something, it doesn't mean you're not just as intelligent as anybody else. It just has to get through the scarred tissue for you, for you to make sense of it. So it takes longer for you to understand complex information and your attention span is less. That's a, that's a bad combination. So by the time you're starting to make sense of the complex information, your attention span has gone somewhere else and you've lost the ability to um, draw the correlations of that complex issue. Um, so students who have that, we often will write letters to give them more time in school to take a test. It's not giving them any sort of unfair advantage. It's actually evening the playing field and, and putting them back where they should be. That it just takes longer to process um, some pieces of information. When you have time tests, that's just not a good mix and doesn't have anything, again, to, to say about a person's intelligence. And that's supposedly what the tests are designed to do. So with cognitive dysfunction, we use the medicines that are used in Alzheimer's disease, but it's a totally different pathology. It's more trying to get information into and out of the temporal lobe. So it's kind of the pathway uh, that, that um, gets the information from the memory center uh, that we're trying to help with these certain medications because the, the chemical, the neurochemical that helps us to do that is the same neurochemical that is involved in storage in the temporal lobe. So people with Alzheimer's disease um, take these medications to try to hold on to what they have, whereas people um, who are affected with MS um, are trying to just get information out of the memory center. It's not that the memory center's damaged, it's just accessing it through the cable system. So the medication can be beneficial um, uh, in MS and it doesn't imply that it's an Alzheimer's type pathology. Um, also, if we manage fatigue and depression better, often cognition's better. And, and I'd say that the most benefit that I can um, provide for someone who has cognitive difficulties is to treat their fatigue. Um, as when we're all tired, you know, if you think of, about it or think back, um, we have more problems with word finding, with processing, speed of our thinking when we're fatigued. So if we can improve our energy, then our thinking generally picks up as well. So a lot of times when people come in and have a, a complaint of cognitive problems, they also have fatigue and we manage their fatigue and lo and behold, the cognition's improved. So um, that's, that's a, one of the aspects. And then when a person has depression, that also can impair cognition. So optimizing the treatment of depression can improve um, the cognition as well. And um, other things to do are kind of do memory exercises, um, not to delay tasks so that you have to build a bigger list of memory in your brain. That just that puts more stress on you. So have something to do, go do it so you don't have to remember to do it later if you have the opportunity to do it. And try to make things easier. So again, you're not having to rely on your, on getting information in, uh, from your temporal lobe um, that it's already out there, it's in a calendar, it's organized, it's in your phone so that you don't have to rely on um, getting it out of your brain. <clears throat> 
So this is another picture in Barcelona down from the park, below the park, um, uh, Guel that you saw earlier. This is um, Familia Sagrada, or Sagrada Familia, which is the world's largest church. And, and it's uh, not completed yet, but will be soon. And uh, it's the, uh, again, like I said, the world's, church, and world's largest church. And, and those facades that you see tell a story. Each one has a story of different individuals. It's, it's, it's an incredible church. Um, and, and it's amazing on the outside, not just architecturally, but all of the little aspects and stories that are told on the facades. Uh, moving to visual difficulties, there are several different things that can affect vision uh, with MS or can be affected. So optic neuritis is inflammation in the optic nerve, uh, double vision or diplopia, nystagmus, which is that fast beating of the eyes, <clears throat> and then something called an INO or intranuclear ophthalmoplegia, which is due to a brainstem lesion that affects the um, equal movement of eyes in synchrony from one side to the other. Optic neuritis is really common. 25% of people with MS, it's a presenting symptom. Um, most common presentation is pain in the eye and, and loss of vision in that eye. Uh, majority of people have return of vision by six months naturally, but they're left with a scar and um, visual acuity in low contrast is, is affected then permanently. Uh, so it, it's to just not treat it and say, well, in six months, it'll be back. Um, it'll be back, but it's not going to be as good as it could have been if we had um, reduced the scar formation and treated the inflammation. So acute treatment um, with uh, the steroids, IV solumedrol or methylprednisolone, ACTHAR, which is a form of ACTH and IVIG or, or immunoglobulins, can help to restore visual function sooner and also think decreased scar formation and long haul help with visual, visual function. Some people have chronic pain with their optic neuritis and the, the way we treat neuropathic pain is the way we treat optic nerve pain as well. Excuse me, so double vision due to brainstem lesion uh, most often. Um, and it's important to say whether your double vision is side by side, diagonal, or on top of each other, vertical, because that tells us where the lesion is and, and what we can expect. Um, <clears throat> if a person has double vision and it doesn't go away after a while, we think it's this is a stable double vision, then prisms in a glass can really, in, eye, in uh, one of the eyeglasses, can really help to normalize and, and redirect uh, the image from into one of the optic nerves and put it back in stereo again. Um, nystagmus is typically um, lesions in the posterior part of the brain um, and the medications listed there, baclofen, primidone, clonazepam, or perhanol are used in treating nystagmus. <clears throat> now, paresthesias or numbness, tingling, um, uh, can be unilateral or bilateral. <clears throat> um, if you had a little bit of tingling in your pinky finger on the non-dominant hand and it didn't do a whole lot, and, we, and let's just say it, we're attributing it to MS, um, you don't necessarily need to treat that. That's, again, quality of life. If it's not interfering with quality of life and um, you could spend $30 on a copay for a medication that may have some mild side effects that you have to take all the time to fix it, is it really improving your quality of life? And probably the answer would be no. <clears throat> Again, treating paresthesias or dysesthesias, painful tingling numbness, is uh, with the agents that we use to treat neuropathic pain. <clears throat> so here's a picture, um, again, of Prague and their main um, castle, um, just a huge, um, that just marvelous architecture, hand-scribed um, uh, uh, buildings and, and big castles and stories and, and such, and somewhere where um, Hitler's second man was and uh, where actually he ended up being assassinated. Um, he had taken up shop in, uh, in that castle behind, so lots of rich history. <clears throat> Uh, weakness, so weakness also unilateral, bilateral. <clears throat> um, it's important to kind of understand that if you have the onset of bilateral weakness, it's almost assuredly in the spinal cord, possibly the brainstem, because the 
the input or output to the limbs um, is really juxtaposed in the brainstem and or spinal cord. Uh, and so a lesion or an attack is likely going to be um, in those areas to cause bilateral um, weakness at the same time. If it's one side, then it can still be in the spinal cord, but also um, more commonly in the brain. Um, <clears throat> Dalfampridine, as I mentioned, um, is a medication for motor fatigability and can restore um, strength, um, not necessarily fully, but possibly in a limb that's weak and can improve walking um, speed and endurance. Uh, rest um, when you, you have fatigability and then assisted devices like ankle foot orthotics or the walk aid or bionis, those things can help a person to um, have better ambulation and some strength back into their limb. <clears throat> Spasticity is a stiffness in, in muscles affected by MS. Um, and relaxing those muscles can help with that discomfort of tightness or a, a blood pressure cuff wrapped around your arm, uh, that feeling of spasticity, muscle cramps, um, and then spasms of the muscles or myoclonus where the arm just flings out. Um, so relaxing that or treating that is helpful, but also, as I mentioned earlier, if someone has spasticity and their muscles really tight and contracted all the time, um, relaxing that muscle is going to free up a whole lot of energy because to contract a muscle requires quite a bit of energy. And the medications uh, listed uh, there, baclofen, tizanidine, um, benzodiazepines occasionally, dantrolene, marinol, um, which is synthetic THC, intrathecal baclofen, um, pumps can help with um, spasticity, um, botulinum toxin. Um, those are most commonly used for spasticity in different situations. Uh, and I guess medical marijuana in some states that's approved um, it can also be used for spasticity. Now here's a picture of Fenway Park in Boston with the green monster over there on the left. And this was the Yankees Red Sox game. So um, this was during uh, the American Academy of Neurology meeting a few years ago that was held in Boston. And uh, I went um, uh, with a colleague to, uh, to the game um, that night. So. Bladder dysfunction. <clears throat> um, bladder dysfunction, two broad categories. You can have a spastic bladder, and that's where you have to go. When you get noticed, there's really no, no time to wait. Out of the way, I need to get to the restroom. You have that urgency to get there. And, I have to go frequently, I just went 15 minutes ago, I have to go again, or I'm up four times in the night with nocturia, um, incontinence, I dribble some out, um, or I actually lose uh, the contents of my bladder um, on the way to the restroom. <clears throat> and a, sp a true spastic bladder, which is really very uh, jumpy bladder, it, it spazzes and it, it lets some urine out, and then if it's really irritable, you usually don't have a lot of urine and, and that irritates the bladder, and then you have to go and you don't have a lot of output, but then you put a little bit more urine in the bladder and then it gets irritated again. So that's kind of a classic um, spastic bladder. And problem <clears throat> more than just the annoyance, uh, irritation of having to go so frequently is social isolation and embarrassment of I don't want to go around if I'm going to be leaking urine and, and, and such, or I'm going to just not engage in activities. Loss of intimacy, um, because uh, I have an accident while, while having intimacy, that's that's not cool. Um, poor sleep, <clears throat> because you're up four or five times at night. You can have skin breakdown from the urine on the skin, causing uh, the cubitus ulcers. And then frequent UTIs from a, a spastic bladder when you don't empty so well and retain urine. So there are more consequences to just I need to get to the restroom quickly and that are important in, in treating bladder dysfunction. So we want to be smart about timing of, of fluid ingestion and the types of fluids that you ingest as well. Um, we have a lot of medications as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in, in the spastic bladder treatment, we have medications with their um, kind of common name and, name and trade name listed there. So the hyphen is the same medication. It's just another way to say it. <clears throat> I'm not going to read the whole list, but we, we do have uh, a number of um, medications available to, to treat and avoid some of the complications of, of that um, 
urinary spasticity. <clears throat> Botox and um, there's some little little pacemaker and by axionics that can help with bladder control um, as well. So we have other things that are non-medicinal to help. And then a retentive bladder is one where the bladder doesn't get signal to go. <clears throat> you know, the bladder is like a sack that's just is holding urine and then to be uh, held before you release it. And when you get up to the fill line on that sack, uh, there's a neural signal to the brain that says, hey, you got to release now. Um, and you may not have that signal and the bladder just overextends. And so uh, you may leak out some urine with laughing and crying with that over full bladder. Um, and then the crude maneuver is where you push down on your bladder to kind of try to empty it. Um, that's often um, seen in a retentive bladder. Uh, treatments are a little bit different and using the um, the common or the um, trade name Flomax or Jalen Rapaflow probanthine and uh, are certain treatments we can to try to help to empty that bladder and then unfortunately self-catheterization has to be used a good bit uh, if the medicines don't work um, and uh, pelvic floor therapy something that's maybe realized a little bit more these days than faster there are therapists that help to really strengthen um, the pelvic floor so if you thought you knew what Kegels were. This is Kegels on steroid and pelvic floor therapy. So they can do a lot to really strengthen that pelvic floor, give you some more control um, uh, over bladder function. <clears throat> so here also um, is uh, Prague on the river and in the middle of Prague and some of the um, really historic architecture that they have. <clears throat> Bowel dysfunction, uh, most commonly it's constipation, but occasionally it's bowel urgency or incontinence. <clears throat> um, Want to make sure that, that one is hydrated well and has enough fiber to keep the stool going forward because hard stool doesn't move um, very well. Um, stool softeners, intermittent laxatives can be helpful. And uh, for the urgency or the diarrhea and oh, I can't go to the movie theater, I can't go out to eat, or I can't go to the office for a visit because I'm going to have diarrhea or loose stools and poor control. Well, then on those occasions, there are a couple of medications, Imodium or Lamotil, that can be used judiciously. You use it too much and get constipation as a rebound. <clears throat> Uh, sexual issues are somewhat common, probably more common than we know. We don't necessarily feel comfortable discussing it either from a clinician or a patient standpoint. So it kind of gets glossed over or not talked about very much. But you know, intimacy is really important, especially um, in a, a chronic condition um, relationships. Uh, the female symptoms us uh, usually are decreased sensation, vaginal dryness, uh, inability to have an orgasm, and in males, it's usually difficulty achieving or maintaining an erection, um, and decreased libido and then decreased intimacy are, are consequences of those issues. You can also have primary decreased libido. <clears throat> so communication is really essential and um, to having um, improved outcomes in, in sexual dysfunction. There are some medications that are commonly used um, and the ones like Viagra and such that are used in males can also be used in females and does help with function sometimes. There's also kind of the pink pill or <clears throat> um, flibanserine for um, female libido, a pink pill that you take daily. There are mechanical devices. Uh, we want to make sure, again, that, that there's not something outside MS like low testosterone that may be affecting uh, function. It really is not neurally based out of MS, so check testosterone levels. Ensure that medications are not having an effect. A lot of the antidepressants uh, will make a person just feel numb, have no, no sensitivity whatsoever. Um, um, so I want to make sure the medications are not having an adverse effect uh, on uh, sexual functioning. <clears throat> Uh, dysphagia or difficulty swallowing, people swallow, um, choking on either saliva, liquids, or solids, or combination therein is, is happens a fair amount of the time. Uh, you can have silent aspiration where it just leaks without you knowing it, it leads to increased uh, uh, amount of pneumonia episodes, um, sometimes prolonged meal time. <clears throat> 
really difficult swallowing takes a long time it may take 45 minutes to an hour to for a meal so if you have three meals that's three hours out of the day and often a caregiver is a, a champion in trying to help a person get through that so <clears throat> dysphagia can be a real issue uh, with ms the antispasticity medications that relax the esophagus can be helpful altering your position when you swallow leaning forward taking smaller bites really cutting up the material um, and being aware of the type of foods uh, that you're putting in can be important. Neurostimulation, specialized straws, um, speech therapy um, do have a place in, in helping with dysphagia as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Pain is really common. I mean, trigeminal neuralgia is probably the most classic, the facial lancinating pain that's stimulated with chewing or uh, shaving or brushing your hair, <coughs> applying makeup. Uh, and leading to this just really awful um, direct nerve pain. Um, the um, central itching, so people, it's not really pain, but it's you have an itch that you just can't get at. Um, that happens in MS uh, as well. Um, and then those types of pain, so the trigeminal neuralgia, neuropathic pain, and the itching, often controlled with anti-epileptic medications, pain, um, can also occur from spasticity. That tightness can be really painful. Um, spasms, um, not moving a limb and getting a contracture, that can be really painful. Headaches are more common, migraines more common in people with MS. So a lot of sources of pain. And my, when my mom was diagnosed back in the 60s, she was told, my dad was told, if there's anything I know that's a, a bright lining in, in MS as far as what you can look forward to. You'll never have pain and never have cognitive dysfunction. So those are were not, um, ended up not to be accurate, but that's where we were back in the 60s and 70s. And we now know that those um, cognition and pain definitely can be central parts of this condition. <clears throat> so here's uh, an iron bowl picture. So this is at Jordan Hare Stadium in Auburn, Alabama playing. Um, uh, against Auburn. So how do we manage pain? Well, we have Alabama beat Auburn. That's the best way. No, but uh, not kidding. Um, AEDs are most commonly used. We can utilize antispasticity agents, control the spasticity and the tightness. Um, trigeminal neuralgia, there's a host of different medications, but even something like Cytotec, which is used for stomach um, acid and, and uh, uh, dysfunction, can be used for trigeminal pain. Um, narcotics do have a place, and they're often underutilized, but um, it's not something that you just throw some narcotic pain medication to take care of, of a person who has pain with MS. That's not a responsible way to treat it. but but there is a place and, and the pendulum swings and sometimes it swings too much in the other direction and people have, uh, suffer because they're not taking pain medication because they're potentially addicting and yet their quality of life is really poor because you're not controlling the pain. It doesn't mean that it has to be something that will be utilized uh, uh, day in and day out, year in and year out, but we do have a lot of options to treat pain. Um, there are also um, pumps and stimulators, like stimulators in the back that override um, neuropathic pain, et cetera. <clears throat> uh, depression. Um, most often it's not, woe is me, I have this chronic condition and I'm not where I thought I would be, but more due to direct lesions in the frontal lobe in the pathway of the chemistry for mood. So we have a mood center in the brain and it relies on having a balance of happy and sad chemicals. And when you have lesions leading into that area, you have an imbalance in the chemistry. And unfortunately, people are made to feel really bad when they have depression. They go, well, what are you depressed about? Johnny across the streets in a wheelchair. Why, you know, you have more ability and more things than, than he or she does. So why are you depressed? And more blaming the person for having depression rather than understanding depression. So I kind of liken it to Salem's Lot and how we treated women with epilepsy back in the day and thought they were witches and burned them. Here we treat people with depression as if it's their doing that they're sad. They can just tough it out and, and, 
and pray more or, or overcome it by thinking and uh, putting their bootstraps up and pulling them up and, and dealing with it. Well, that would be like telling someone with diabetes, insulin dependent diabetes, well, just throw away your insulin. What are you doing? Just, you know, man up and, and deal with it. <clears throat> it's the same thing. It's a chemical imbalance in an organ of the body, which this happens to be the brain and not the pancreas. So it's really important to understand that a person with depression is not um, a weak individual who um, uh, needs to just uh, get tougher to deal with their depression. This is a physical substrate. It's a medical problem of the brain um, that requires treatment. <clears throat> now, depression, just like diabetes, gets worse when the person's stressed. So stress picks on weak areas. And so the mood center, when it's imbalanced with either depression or anxiety, is a weakened pathway. And so it's going to be susceptible to stress, just like MS is susceptible to the stress of heat or a bladder infection or diabetes um, is susceptible to stress. A diabetic who eats well and takes their medication, has a good sugar, gets really stressed, but continues to eat well and take their medication, their sugar will bump up to 500 in a minute. <clears throat> and you know, we don't say, oh, well, you just need to man up and, and deal with that. You treat um, the diabetes and you take care of the things that stress the system. All right. So, so the stress didn't cause depression. The stress didn't cause anxiety, just like the stress didn't cause depression, uh, diabetes. The stress worsened the conditions. So that's where psychologists, psychiatrists, very vital to help a person to manage and, and mitigate stress's impact on this medical problem of depression. <clears throat> So um, anxiety is very similar. 50% of patients and patients with anxiety are saying, well, you need to um, just control your anxiety. You know, that you need to um, just go calm yourself. And whereas that's great to try to um, do things to kind of calm the stress down, it's an underlying medical problem. And so there are things that sometimes require treatment. So calming teas, you know, baths, warming baths that aren't too hot to affect your function. Um, Buspirone uh, or Buspar is a non-benzodiazepine anti-anxiety medication that may be helpful. And then benzodiazepines um, like Valium and Ativan, Xanax, uh, Clonopin, a lot of people shy away because of the opioid crisis or fear of addiction or fear of stigma. Um, well, anxiety disorder significantly impacts quality of life. So if one does um, the appropriate things and there's still a significant amount of anxiety, they have a very appropriate place in treating anxiety. And one shouldn't be um, <clears throat> uh, categorically against a treatment um, that has a, has a place. So um, something not, again, to be taken lightly or thrown at a person with anxiety and just liberally, it's something uh, that's there that can really help. It, it requires a lot of thought and, and interaction. Uh, therapists can be very helpful. So pseudobulbar affect or pseudobulbar palsy, what I talked about earlier, is that um, uncontrollable laughing or crying, something that start out, something might be mildly funny and you kind of chuckle, but there's ha-ha, and it's, it's some kind of laughter that just keeps going or laughing at something that maybe isn't terribly funny, uh, crying at, at something that uh, uh, a television ad that, that wasn't you know, terribly sad, um, those sorts of things. They can be really disabling because they affect a person in between events. So a person's fearful of laughing at the funeral or crying at some kind of party. So they shy away from it. So they kind of withdraw and uh, can't be themselves. So treating it maybe more than just treating the event, the actual crying or the laughing, but treating the person who can then feel free to kind of be themselves and not be fearful of, of laughing or crying inappropriately. So Nudexta is the most effective treatment we have for that. <clears throat> it's a combination of a, um, uh, an, an anti-cough, medication and tonic water. Um, and antidepressants have been used in the past for that and can be helpful, um, though uh, it's not depression when a person has um, uncontrollable crying uh, or laughing. So here's the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, uh, which was right next to one of the um, MS meetings um, a couple of years ago. <clears throat> 
So shifting gears from symptoms to new and future treatments, um, <clears throat> some of the more recent treatments, and I guess recent is, is relative. We really haven't had an opportunity to go out and uh, provide talks and, and update patients on medication. So since the pandemic or just before the pandemic, uh, Mazent was approved, and then we have Saposia, Humeridi, Casimpta, generic um, injectable DMTs have become available. So these are the treatments that have come out maybe here recently approved by the FDA for the treatment of relapsing forms of MS. Um, BTK inhibitors is a totally different mechanism of action. Uh, so potential future treatment, there are a few of them in phase two and phase three clinical studies right now. They impact the effect of B cells. So unlike a couple of other, our other treatments, which are classified as B-cell depleters, they knock out B-cells. These affect some of the function of B-cells, but don't knock out the cell line. So may have a different uh, approach, which uh, is, is kind of attractive. Uh, hopefully they'll be successful in the clinical trials. <clears throat> Maybe a new S1P receptor agonist uh, approved um, um, soon, and, and that's what Mason and Zaposi are in, that, they're in that category. Uh, Vumeridae is in the Tecfidera um, category, and Casimpta is in the Ocrevus or B-cell depleter category. And then there are a bunch of repurposed medications. So these are medications that are approved for other conditions that are now being looked at to help um, remyelinate. So things like metformin and biotin, clemestine, or what used to be called Tavist, Dilantin, uh, Seroquel, Myconazole, Indocin. These are medications that in animal studies have shown some benefit towards remyelination and are moving forward to be tested uh, in remyelination. Um, and, and of course, we have stem cells and bone marrow transplant. Um, those things, unfortunately, have been going on quite a while, and we're not <clears throat> we're not there to have it universally available for remyelination yet. And I hope hope that day comes very soon. So, moving from uh, those treatments into clinical trials, the things that lead us to those new treatments. Um, just briefly on clinical trials, once we get through animal studies and human studies, there are usually three phases of clinical trial that lead to approval. <clears throat> a phase one study is a safety study. Uh, so it, it generally involves healthy um, volunteers and provides the medication and, and see that a person does fine, doesn't grow a horn or turn green or something along those lines. As long as it's deemed to be safe, then it moves forward. Um, and that can be also you know, studied in, in individuals with MS too. It doesn't have to be in healthy volunteers. Uh, and then we go to phase two, which is a dose finding study. So there are generally several different doses of the treatment uh, versus placebo or versus another medication are tested to find what the optimal uh, treatment balance between efficacy or effectiveness and side effects is. So the phase two figures out what's the dose we want to really move on to phase three to, to gain approval. And then phase three studies are the large studies um, that um, test the treatment versus either a placebo or another active treatment that we have available uh, for MS. And FDA generally requires two phase three studies to be favorable in order for a medication to be approved. The phase four studies are usually looking at things after a medication is approved, uh, quality of life issues, how well does it do in this way or that way from cognition or what's the tolerability like in the general population, not just the restricted um, clinical trial population of phase uh, two and three. <clears throat> now, it's important to know that even negative <clears throat> trial results are helpful. They help us to know we don't need to be knocking down that door again or oh, we thought this was going to be an important mechanism. Maybe something very similar is going to be very helpful. So although a trial may turn out not to give us a product at the end of the day, um, it can be very helpful to direct our learning and make it uh, you know, uh, much more concise. So some of the, the pros and cons of clinical trials. <clears throat> Potential virtues are you're contributing to our knowledge uh, for the benefit of mankind and generations to come who are saddled with this um, condition. So um, so it, it's very important, um, not just 
to your own individual case or those in the, in the surrounding area, but really to the whole world that may um, have to treat MS down the road. Um, it may provide a beneficial access to something years before it becomes available and approved. Um, uh, it has close observation associated with it. So one's watched very closely with visits and uh, phone follow-up, how are you doing, et cetera, MRIs that are uh, maybe done more frequently than they would be in the general um, clinic. Uh, MRIs and other assessments are generally free and a lot of times there's pay for travel. So your travel time, uh, uh, gas, et cetera, is paid for to come for the assessment. So those, those are potential pros. And individuals who don't have any insurance, this is really um, very attractive to be able to have um, close observation, lots of visits, uh, MRI scan for free, uh, and a treatment. <clears throat> um, the potential pitfalls and side effects can be that who knows what the medication is gonna have as far as a side effect and um, close observation. So I said that's a benefit, but that also can be a con if you have to go somewhat frequently, you have a work schedule or it's a little bit of a travel, sometimes that is more of an obstacle than a benefit, it can go either way. <clears throat> so, um, so clinical trials really can be, um, you know, are necessary for us to move forward, can be very helpful, have some unique benefits and, and have some cons that one must be aware of. <clears throat> Now, access during COVID. So, what a what a wild year, year and a half, or year and um, few months we've had. Uh, just changed so many different aspects of our life uh, that we took for granted, um, and some of that was clinic visits. So, there are some um, clinics, unfortunately, treating MS that have not gotten back to seeing patients yet. They're still telehealth um, visits only, and um, you know that's just that's uh, unfortunate and um, uh, glad that we have telehealth uh, to be able to provide services and, and we have Zoom meetings and all of these sorts of things uh, available to us. But um, to me, nothing like being in person and uh, and laying hands on and, and seeing. I think um, it's very helpful to have that if possible. But uh, really variable, you know, different states have different uh, restrictions and different uh, levels of being open. Uh, so that changes what uh, what happens with healthcare in um, uh, NMS during COVID. Um, <clears throat> now the foundations are there still still available to provide help. So um, uh, free MRIs for patients who don't have insurance every two years is available or paying for a copay or deductible that's extremely high um, every two years um, is a really helpful aspect of, of um, one of the um, support um, agencies and, and all of them have, have unique things that they can offer that can really be helpful and, and during COVID it's, it's worth a look if you're trying to get something and don't feel like you have access to it is to uh, contact one of the agencies and see what they can do to suggest to you or provide for you. Um, and I believe most people with MS who are under 65 have a 1C designation for the COVID vaccine, uh, which means that have an autoimmune condition um, in, in an age uh, that way. And, and that group is either up for the vaccine now or soon to come. So there should be access to the vaccine if you want it. And I'm not endorsing the vaccine or speaking against the vaccine. Vaccine is a really personal choice. Um, uh, there are um, most of the treatments with MS are not against one getting the vaccine. Uh, so um, <clears throat> it's uh, something that um, is generally acceptable to take if you have MS, but um, is um, is really a personal choice when you come down to, is this right for me or not? We don't have enough long-term information, I believe, on the effects of the virus, nor the effects of the vaccine to clearly um, give instruction as far as that goes. Uh, we will have more information as time goes on. So last, lastly, kind of the section I wanna talk about is just kind of um, how do you talk to your healthcare provider and what what's that? interaction look like? Well, it should be a shared decision. We're talking about medications to treat your MS or um, other aspects of treating MS. It should be, you know, we all bring different things to the table. So a patient has their lifestyle, their certain emotional makeup, um, <clears throat> their um, work, their family, um, fatigue, cognition, uh, fear of safety or 
brazen openness to try anything. It's it's very individual, and that's what a, a patient brings to um, that discussion. And then clinician typically understands uh, uh, the data from clinical trials and just uh, the gestalt of how things work and their own experience in clinic um, with patients of different kind of makeups and can talk about that. And then hopefully we marry those two and have a good discussion on uh, what we should, uh, how we should proceed. <clears throat> uh, and kind of breaking down again, kind of um, the, the clinician side of things, um, we know we have a lot of data on the importance of early treatment that uh, benign MS is only something you can say after the fact. So do you want to roll the dice early and, and hope that that's what you have and not go into treatment? Um, <clears throat> what are the different prognostic factors that say you may have a worse outcome or better outcome? Um, is this patient likely to be committed to this therapy or this um, endeavor, um, et cetera? Um, so lots goes into that decision on, on both sides. <clears throat> So communication with your team, it's um, first thing is ensure you're on a team. Ensure that um, you're not the subject and you're told to do X, Y, and Z. And if you don't, then really you're not going to be treated the, the same way. Ensure that you're a part of that and that we're all working together. Everyone should be working together, hopefully, for your, for your betterment. That's what we want, best possible outcome. Don't overutilize the clinic. Call about everything you see on the news or any sort of every symptom that you have. Now, early on, of course, we understand that things are really new and you don't under, you know, not sure if this is important or that's important. And, and certainly contact the clinic in that situation. But but um, uh, be mindful of time and, and be appropriate in, in the questions you ask and, and the responses. And some patients, unfortunately, will speak 15, 20 minutes and call three or four times um, during the week. And that, that really takes up staff time to be able to, to care for others. And it's not absolutely necessary. Don't overutilize. And then don't underutilize. Don't just shy away and only bring up things during appointments. You had a relapse. Yeah, I got weak. But, you know, I wanted to kind of endure that. And I thought I could wait, you know, a few weeks or months to get back to clinic. So, <clears throat> you know, try to find that right balance of how do you, you let the clinic work with you. Um, become educated on what's a relapse, a pseudo relapse, worsening of neurological function um, that's not related to new disease, but old disease. Um, get prepared for the office visit. So know your medications updated list. When did you have your last MRI so you can provide that information? If you have disability forms or other forms that need to be treated, um, um, filled out for work, make sure you have those when you go um, to the visit rather than scrambling afterwards. Um, have a main problem list and then maybe a lesser list, an ideal list, so that we could certainly can address the main problems and get to those and uh, then hopefully can and get to the other one. I had one patient today who had over four pages of symptoms and issues. And whereas that's important, there were certain certain ones that were maybe more important to address and the other ones were really chewing up on on time that I could provide for someone else and could have been addressed in a different way. Here's a list of questions that I have and if you could kindly address them and get back with me later, I'm not gonna chew up your clinic time today with those uh, particular questions or thoughts or issues. <clears throat> um, the, uh, the difficulties are, you know, prior authorizations for medications, those are a real pain um, and uh, disability um, forms and that whole process and just getting disability, how long that takes, pain management. Those are issues that take a good bit of work um, on the part of the clinic, so be mindful of that. And, and again, we try to work as a team best we can to get those things taken care of. Um, logistics of, of um, calling, emailing, text portals, make sure you kind of um, understand your different ways to be able to communicate with the clinic. And if it's not working well, you know, if something happens, we'll you know, bring that up, let us know um, so that we can work on trying to make that better. And I think I'm gonna get the gong uh, uh, yank here in a minute from Stu, because I'm probably going over, but I think, I think that's it. I think- Don't, uh, don't say that, done, don't say that. I, I was taking, I was, I lost all my bets because of that. <laughs> all my bets on how long it was going to be. <laughs> so, um, so hopefully that was helpful, and, and I'm happy to entertain questions uh, related so, to that. 
yeah, and we are. We have a lot of questions, and I want to first thank you virtually, of course. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, um, that was a incredible amount of information. I have a lot of questions for you. I'm challenging the audience to have as many as I have for you based mm -hmm. on everything you spoke about. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll see. I, I think I'm going to win this one. <laughs> um, but but anyway, uh, let's get started. So personally, okay. I'm going to start with I'm going to start with one person from the audience and I'll go back and forth. Okay. And again, though, I do want to thank you for doing this. I do want to thank our sponsors for those that came in late. Um, they're on the screen behind me. You could see who they are. OK. And um, for those that did come in late, if you have any questions, there's a orange box at the top of the screen. It's a not actually a box. It's a rectangle. If you could click on it, you could type in your questions there and I will see everything and I will call out your questions. OK, so firstly, I do want to start with a person named Michelle. Where'd the question go? Oh, my gosh. Here we go. So a whole bunch started typing and I lost her question. All right. What are your thoughts on five year post Lemtrada and taking the COVID vaccine? Is there a better vaccine? Is there a better vaccine for the MS patients? OK, so um, so five years post Lemtrada, one ought to be, you know, be immune, totally immune competent. So um, uh, the data looks, uh, you know, very good for outcomes in people who've had Lemtrada um, and five years later, as far as control of relapses, new lesions and um, and need for retreatment, it's been it's been very positive uh, overall in general. Um, as far as getting a vaccine at that point, there's, there should be absolutely no difficulty in in um, receiving a vaccine five years out for Lemtrada. Once now, there's very there are rare individuals who be, have low counts and they they stay low after treatment and they they're an enduring low count. Um, and you just want to ensure in, in that individual that you know, the lymphocyte or CD4 count or this or that is, is appropriate to have the vaccination. But 99.9% .9 of patients who are five years post Lemtrada um, ought to be able to take a COVID vaccine without any difficulty. Now, one better than the other. We don't have any comparative trials of the different vaccines to say this one's better than that one or uh, we, we just don't um, have that information. And, and as far as reactions to this one or that one, we just, there just isn't anything comparative and we don't have enough time out really to see how that shakes out. Um, <clears throat> so I, I wouldn't say there's one any better than the other in that setting. All right, thank you for that. So that's gonna lead into another question, but before I get to that, I gotta, I gotta this has been irking me. I saw you had a list of those that have, uh, the companies that, have access during COVID. I want to let you know that there's a acronym for an organization that you missed, yeah. and they they by far lead all the others in educational programs during COVID, and that's MS Views and News. All and right. I, yeah. <laughs> you missed so, MSVN, yes. all right? You yeah, missed so, it by a long shot. So we we're involved in it, too. I thought it was pretty self doing eight to ten programs a month. I mean, come on. Doing an awesome job. This is this is fabulous for for information for MS and and uh, resources that way, certainly educational and whatnot. And and some of the other ones that I listed may be more for, you know, um, wheelchairs and other devices and yeah. things like that, that they have built ramps and okay. stuff like that. So they all, all of you all do a great job. And from an education standpoint, certainly you've, uh, during the pandemic, been far and away the, the, uh, the leader as far as that goes. Thank you. All right, so a great follow-up question though, to the one that you were just answering is by a person named Cindy, and she's asking, after completing Lemtrada treatment, would my, will my COVID vaccine be invalid, or will my body recognize the B and T cells that were already trained? So you're, yeah, that's a great question. Your, your body makes memory cells. So you knock out, um, with, with Lemtrada, the, the treatment knocks out B cells and T cells. So it knocks out your lymphocytes. Now, not 100%, you don't have zero counts at the end of the day, but it really knocks them down the vast majority of those cells. So you have some, um, uh, some remaining of the old, but you really reset totally new B cells and T cells, which is great. Now, memory cells are not as affected by Lemtrada. So those vaccines you had, let's say, to measles and mumps and shingles and everything before, and if you had a COVID vaccine in the past, all those, you should have memory cells and plasma cells that are unaffected by the Lemtrada treatment. So that should not invalidate what you've had before. <clears throat> and then 
after at least four months of being on Lemtrada, you should be able to handle a vaccine and make an appropriate immune response um, to that new thing that you're getting vaccinated with. So there's this four month period after treatment where you would say, if you just received treatment and during that first four months, probably not a good idea to get the COVID vaccine then because you may not have adequate number of B cells to make a response, an appropriate response to, to COVID. But after that, yes, and all the memory cells you had from before should still be working um, for what you've been immunized in the past. <clears throat> okay, great, thank you for that. Uh, by the way, before I continue, uh, Michelle, whose question we asked at the beginning. Just wanted to thank you for all you're doing for those of us fighting with MS, okay? You're welcome, so, thank you. Keep inspiring us to do a good so, job. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, you know, while um, you were doing your talk, you interspersed uh, all your different photos from, from all your um, um, MS events that you've gone to, and I will uh, break up the talk with giving you the kudos for those that give it to me to give to you, okay? Thank you. Okay, yeah. great. Good. Now, also, we're going to have vaccine questions, everybody. We also have questions on MS in rural America. We also have questions for access to care. We are going to be getting to all of these questions because Dr. Legank went over on what he was going to be doing. He's now staying until we finish these questions, right? Yes. <laughs> great. Absolutely. Good. Even flat tires aren't going to get in the way. Nope. Not <laughs> okay, flat. cool. All right, great. Thank you. All right, so the next one, uh, we're going to switch off a little bit. Uh, what is, how to get great care in rural America? How do they get good MS care? Well, you know, my, the town I'm in is 16,000. So we would be classified as a rural area. So there, there are centers in, in rural areas and, and uh, um, in major centers that aren't too, too far from rural areas that are available. It really, I, you know, it's going to be a very unique question if you're in, the outskirts of Montana and, and there's just not anything right there locally, it's gonna take a little bit of a trip um, to get to a center, but then you then you really wanna be prepared for, hey, I can't just pop in or drop by or uh, what's my plan? What's the strategy to have uh, in case this happens or that happens and I'm way over this part of the state? Um, and Fortunately, telehealth has, has really grown um, and, uh, and uh, being able to go through Zoom or other th other platforms, having texts and having access to that. So I know, you know, I have people that I take care of from California, uh, from Alaska, from the Bahamas, from you know, many states out west and, and they can't just pop in or you know, they have a question or problem or can you take a look at this? So um, we, you know, in those cases, I'll provide text access and um, you can send me a picture this way or just alter things so that we can provide um, good care from afar and then be also ready to set someone up with someone local. So uh, if you have to be seen or have a problem that I have somebody I can contact that can see you uh, in that area. So I think a number of us uh, do treat and I know several others who speak on this and for Stu, um, in Ohio and other places, we'll see patients from all over and, and the same thing. So we, uh, we want to be accessible. And I know a lot of us from around different parts of the country want to be accessible to people in more rural settings or in, uh, underserved areas and be able to provide good quality care. So we try to change things up a little from the normal routine to be able to give you access uh, to information and also have a network that we can provide for you if if you just have to go local. Right. So in my res my response question to that is, what will you do post COVID? Will you continue with telehealth? Yeah, you know, I never did telehealth. We we kept we stayed open every day. We never closed a day for COVID. Um, so we we um, had some telehealth visits for those who are. You know, it was not a good idea to get out and about, but we stayed open as well. Um, but yeah, we we would continue to have telehealth as um, uh, is necessary for that particular issue. And then, like I said, um, I I often will give out my number to be texted to to deal with issues that occur um, from afar uh, directly or um, uh, some kind of chain that we use that allows um, better access. All right. So another question that I have for you, that I have for you, um, not necessarily for me, but for everybody else, is 
regarding the telehealth, is it only about you being on those telehealth calls? Like if they need you to speak to your physical therapist and they can't get to you, is it possible that your, te- that your physical therapist will be able to do a telehealth call with them? Yeah, I would, um, uh, I haven't run into that situation, but I would not see where that's a problem. Um, you know, as long as uh, the therapist has, you know, time in the day or is willing to make extra time to be able to provide that service. And, and as far as other specialties, I think the same goes. I think that a lot understand that this is a different time, but hopefully it also provided an opportunity for us to understand that access to care you know, isn't just uh, a problem because there's a virus that's going around. It's because there's proximity right. and there's physical um, disabilities and other difficulties. And we should be open and available uh, as best we can. And if we can't, because we're only one person, do it. Do we have a, a nurse or a nurse practitioner, or a PA, or like you said, a therapist? If it's a therapy question or um, urologist, and, and hopefully we're more kind of in tune to that and more available. Uh, and I, I don't create any more hours in the day, so it's still, you know, a challenge that way. But uh, hopefully, our mindset is we're uh, we're open to that idea. It may take us a little while, but we're open to it. Okay, thank you. Paula mm-hmm. is asking, recently diagnosed with MS, however, a progressive form. Which medication should I be aware of to listen and research their side effects? Uh, so the, they're really two progressive forms, primary progressive and secondary progressive MS, and um, uh, they're treated a little bit differently. Um, secondary progressive disease that has had relapses or, or inflammation or has relapses, it's really treated the same as, as a person with relapsing remitting um, disease, so that, that's typically not a whole lot different. Someone with primary progressive, there's only one approved DMT for primary progressive MS uh, that we have. Uh, we want to ensure that that diagnosis is correct because it's not always correct and it's a maybe uh, a relapsing form that's just attack after attack and it looks like it's progressive but it, it it's really has a lot of inflammation and can be treated more like a relapsing form or inflammatory form uh, so you want to make sure that first but truly if there's progressive condition uh, you know um, the NIH um, or yeah nih.gov.clinicaltrials gives a list and you put MS in and, and it'll show you all the clinical trials and the different aspects of MS from symptom management to relapsing remitting to progressive forms of MS and lets you see what the trials are and then what's available. And then um, you can contact your healthcare provider to see if there's some site there locally that's performing clinical trials. And, and generally when you are interested in a clinical trial, there's something called an informed consent. That's a lengthy um, uh, set of papers that talks to you about uh, what it is involved in getting into the trial, what excludes you from the trial, what allows you to get into the trial, and then talks about side effects and, and, and that needs to be discussed before anybody signs up for a trial. So generally we um, we'd provide that information about side effects, risk benefits, uh, when a person is moving forward and is eligible to participate in the clinical trial. Thank you. We have a lot of questions to go through, okay. and I know that you don't want to be there all night. I know your family wants to see you too, all right? But yeah. uh, if you could just shorten them a little bit, then we can uh, get through all these questions, okay? Okay. Um, that would be great. Thank you. And I got even people asking me about your pictures. I mean, we're going to get to those also, right? <laughs> all right, Fair first. First, Nick is asking, I'm on Ocrevus. Do the B cell do B cell depletions affect asthma? <clears throat> um, you know, asthma is not a major contraindication or side effect to B cell therapies. Uh, it's usually a, um, a different kind of uh, it's a the, the E B cell and and um, um, that's affected in and um, mast cells, et cetera, that's more important in asthma. So um, it's not a contraindication if you have asthma to go on those treatments. Thank you. All right. Um, Catherine, well, she not, doesn't have a question. She just wants to say, your traveling photos interspaced are great. Okay. Thanks, Catherine. Thank <laughs> sure the doctor, sure the doctor's happy with that too. I actually found them very interesting. Yeah. All right. Back to Cindy. She's asking, 
let's see. She's got a couple of questions. My MS doctor is out of state. When I have significant issues, what is the best way to communicate with him? And how can he ensure my other doctors are on the same page? Well, um, two things. One is you want to have that plan. You want to have a discussion. If this happens, um, what what do I do? Um, you know, how do I have access uh, to to receive care? So that's the direct um, response, and then then it's also really important to discuss about if if I happen to have to get care there local and I can't go across state, you know, not going to be able to make it across state lines. What's our plan of action? And so we we would articulate. Okay, I would say that you know I'm going to contact your primary care. I need his number or uh, this neurologist is someone that I would contact on your behalf. So just setting up a plan, uh, I think, is best rather than wait till something happens and then scramble to try to find a solution. Great, thank you. All right, um, let's see. We have Paula. When do I find information on recognizing symptoms, episodes, flare-ups, etc., to determine and when? I need to get to the ER. Okay, <clears throat> so that's a that's a great question. There are a bunch of sites that that, that talk about a true MS relapse or a pseudo relapse, um, and really, when when a person has a pseudo relapse, they have old symptoms that come out. Um, let's say you had a bladder infection in the past. You had weakness on the right side. You you the bladder infection then brings out the old weakness on the right side that's not likely something that's going to require you to go to the hospital and be treated for except the infection. So you want to treat the bladder infection, but you're not going to need um, steroids for worsening MS symptoms that are old symptoms related to some stressor. So, you know, uh, and I'll just go to one one site and I'm sure there, there are several. Um, I know all those agencies I listed. Um, I'll just say that the National MS Society has a huge library of information if you type them in um, and talk about uh, relapse for pseudo relapse or symptoms like fatigue, pain, et cetera. Though there'll be a lot of information there and they can redirect you to other places to find that information. Great, thank you very much. How do people find out more about their nighttime leg spasticity? <clears throat> and what um, do they do about it? If water, if water is being used to a great extent, which I'm hearing about from this person, if water is being used to a great extent, what, and he's still getting leg spasticity, what can he do to ease what might happen? Okay. So um, hydration is really important, but hydration is not the only answer. So electrolytes um, have to be uh, available too. So you can get too much water and, and, and just water and no um, other electrolytes. And it's kind of pathological. Water drinking can lead to more cramping. But let's just say that a person's well hydrated, still having cramping. It's not too much water. Um, then the, the spasticity can be treated with spasticity agents. We wanna make sure that um, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and electrolytes are fine, that that's not a problem and we need to replace that because that could be the answer. Um, wanna make sure, um, well, and then some kind of common remedies, so the, the anti-spasticity agents, but some people have a patient who, who takes a tablespoon of pickle juice before he goes to bed, and that keeps him from ever having a cramp. That works great for him, it doesn't work for everybody. Uh, somebody uh, takes a packet of yellow mustard. When they're starting to have a lot of cramps at night, they'll have a packet of mustard before they go to bed. They don't have any cramps. So those are, those are kind of other um, uh, things that people do outside of typical uh, agents to try to help prevent cramps. Um, there's a lot to, to, to answer that question, but those are just kind of the down and dirties, I guess. So yeah. I have I have to thank you for that answer, but I have to make light of the pickle one. Um, is that for whole sour or is that half sour? <laughs> uh, probably more vinegar, the better. So. <laughs> Great. Okay, got it. So going back to the um, the electrolytes, um, I know that for children we give them like Pedialyte. Is that right. something that adults can take as well? Sure, and you know, Gatorade, um, something or Powerade or something along those lines. If you have diabetes or sugar problems, you don't want to do that necessarily, but something like that. But of course, you drink before you go to bed, then you're probably going to be up in a little while to go into the restroom. So uh, maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> right. All right. Uh, next one um, we have um, in rural America. How do people get more access to resources? I mean, I can answer that, but you can too. So we'll leave it up to you, though. So there's something called Stu's Views or uh, <laughs> this network channel. That was called MS Views and News. Yeah. Stu's Views has been gone for a long time. I'm still hanging on to it. So, so um, a lot of people. Me too. <laughs> uh, 
So, uh, but it's, uh, you know, this is a great resource, really, honestly. Um, uh, I'm not trying to be self-promoting for Stu, but but boy, you can you can find out so much information by by going through um, this network. And you know, he has he has um, videos from talks that I've given in the past, and many other MS specialists and and other um, specialties that are related to MS, from diet and alternative treatments and spasticity and exercise and you name it. Stu has videos for all of those that are that are free to access from you um, through his channel. So any portion of them, any aspect, you know, social security, disability, job, just, you name it, anything you can probably think of, um, you have a resource through this channel and this network. And as I mentioned, the MS Society and the MSA, MS Foundation also have information about uh, uh, different parts of MS. So whether you're in rural America or big city America, you have access through those different um, forums. Um, and then you can also ask, you know, your healthcare provider when you go to a visit, what what sort of resources they might have uh, to refer you to. That's right. And by the way, I did not pay him to say anything about Stu's not views or or, or MS Views and News. And if you're wondering about Stu's Views, so when I first started this, way before there was an MS organization of MS Views and News, I personally had Stu's Views and MS News, which was a blog, it was a newsletter, it was many things, we were doing a lot for people around. And then we got corporate, all right? So had to, had to do that. But anyway, thanks Doc for remembering about Stu's Views and MS News, it's always great to hear that. All right, so going forward, all right, so Bill wants to know, if your picture of the Hoover Dam, when was it? <laughs> uh, that, that wasn't the Hoover Dam. So. Oh. <laughs> no, I think the water one was one in Prague. Okay. Uh, sort of on the river we'll, in Prague. We'll just, we'll just write to Bill and let him know that he screwed up about that, all right? <laughs> all right, we'll next one. <laughs> next one, Michelle is asking, um, are you doing any remyelination trials? We haven't been asked to do any remyelination trials. Um, we'd be definitely open to doing that. We we were, did participate in the anti a couple of the anti lingo trials, which were remyelinating trials. But at the present time, we're not uh, engaged in any of those trials. Okay. Question: Are you doing any um, hormonal type trials for uh, those for women, those for men, to help them with um, uh, decrease of fatigue? No, we're not in uh, uh, any of those symptomatic uh, trials at this point. You know, we're, we're kind of, um, we're at the behest of the companies that run the trials to ask us. And I don't know that we've turned too many down um, to look at things, but we're kind of at their behest to, uh, um, okay. to be involved in the trials. But we're not in any of those uh, hormonal trials. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, next, uh, is it okay that I wait for my area city council to call me to set up an appointment for the vaccine or should i be more proactive about getting it um yes <laughs> so that's that depends on um you know what your situation is if you're in a high risk area of getting getting covid you may want to push a little bit further if you have comorbidities that put you at greater risk of having a problem with covid you know you may want to push that a little bit further um, and it's, I think it's helpful to get a letter. So we've, I can't tell you how many letters we've given to patients that states that they have an autoimmune condition and uh, should receive the vaccine sooner than later um, that they can take to the different sites, health department, to the hospital, to the pharmacies, to help them to gain access to the vaccine sooner. So you can, you can ask your healthcare team to, to assist you as well if you really want to get it sooner. Um, so that's what I would do. Okay, thank you for that. Um, a person is writing that they've had relapse remitting MS since 1998 and wants to know what the suspected rate of progression for his or her MS is. Uh, there is uh, unfortunately no way to answer that because everybody's different. And, and some people have a relapse every 10 years, some have it every few months. Um, it changes in the course of MS. Sometimes there's a fair number of relapses early and it kind of burns itself out from relapses later on. Uh, secondary progressive MS is different depending on how much damage was done before uh, and what kind of treatments and how early the intervention was. So unfortunately, it's very difficult 
um, to predict, uh, you know, the prognosis from that point forward, and especially without knowing, uh, you know, the, the details of your history. Uh, but I would, um, you know, regardless of where you're at, you know, I think it's maximal care, you know, offering maximal care to improve quality of life. And that should be what you feel you get from your healthcare team that we're trying to make sure that I have the best absolute neurological health as possible, given my state of affairs. Great. Thank you for that. Um, you say we give up. Okay. It's, you know, there's nothing to do that. That just shouldn't be a part of, of uh, the, the first response to where you're at. <clears throat> okay. What is the best way for a person living in rural America to meet others with MS in rural America? Like if somebody was in the middle of Wyoming, how are they going to meet others with MS near to them? Uh, I guess um, one is, um, well, that's where I think the MS Society and local chapters or local MS groups, whatever, whether it's affiliated with the MS Society or not, can be helpful to seek out the support groups that are in the local area. I think that's that's helpful. And if you, you don't know where to go for that, then then um, talk to your uh, neurology team and say, okay, I want to, you know, is there a support group or some kind of um, meeting um, situation that occurs so with people with MS in this area? Uh, and some of the pharmaceutical companies have, will match a person with people who are of similar situation, like a divorced mom of three. How do you handle your MS? They have peer contacts, you know, anonymously, where they can they can connect you with someone who's in a similar state uh, of affairs and uh, and talk. Uh, so some of them have offered that. Uh, I'm not sure what where what all of them are doing um, this day and age, but that has been something that's been available um, through several of the pharmaceuticals that treat MS. Great, thank you for that. All right, um, going forward. What, if any, are new findings, medications, research opportunities, MS? I, I know you mentioned it before, but what do you see as the newest things coming along? And uh, the, the soonest that you see, it, the soonest ones coming out. Well, the BTK inhibitors probably are, are here, are knocking on the door right now. And, you know, I mean, we've been talking about stem cells for remyelination forever and hoping that that would come forward. So. Um, you know, we're still hopeful that very soon we'll have um, some kind of protocol to be able to help with remyelination along that, that line of remyelination. Um, small particles, nanoparticles, um, uh, and, and really with the COVID vaccine, the mRNA strategy of, of having your DNA produce something against aberrant T cells or T cell receptors is something that's, uh, I think, moving forward, has more energy at the present time. And there may be others, but that's kind of what I've been exposed to lately. Okay, thank you. There's a person asking about the church in Barcelona, and I'm just going to answer this real quick. It's called Google. Look it up. <laughs> it's all there. Not a familiar. <laughs> right. All right. Um, next thing, uh, going back to the BTK inhibitors, my next question for you on this is, what do you see favorable about the BTK inhibitors versus what we have available now? <laughs> Well, it's a unique uh, mechanism. So working through um, through B cells still, you know, for forever we had T cell kind of emphasis and we we're trying to affect the T cells forever. And then <clears throat> Rituxan showed benefit and that led to, to Ocrevus and that Casimpta. But those are B cell depleters, so they get rid of the B cells. And, and that's okay for many people, but <clears throat> if you um, keep the B cell around and alter some of its function, um, functional aspect. That's a unique way to to treat MS, and and no, uh, and some people with MS do not uh, respond to many different treatments. So having a different mechanism of action, I think, is really um, uh, quite appealing. Uh, the, the more different approaches we have to to treating this disease, so much the better. And um, uh, the tolerability in the trials has been good thus far. So side effects have not seemed to be a major problem. Uh, at this juncture um, with that treatment. So having another option of a treatment that's very effective, um, uh, works differently, and to this point has good safety, I think is, is, a, is, a, is a good treatment. Right. right. Thank you for that. Uh, Catherine writes, have you had experience with an inner, with inner implants to help walk? It's for tremor and balance, but could you help me with, <clears throat> help me walk with MS? 
Uh, there, there are, um, yeah, there are implantable devices for tremor, for cerebellar dysfunction, and so on uh, that have been utilized. Um, unfortunately, globally, they haven't been um, as successful as we would like. I know for someone with essential tremor, tremor, those um, those implantables can help with tremor. Uh, balance has been less uh, less benefited, if you will, from from that kind of a treatment. Uh, but there's a, a lot of active research. You know, you have the rewalk, and and I saw some um, uh, different things in future treatment where there's implantable um, electrodes that help someone who's quadriplegic move uh, their arm over and grab a plate just by stimulating the part of the brain. So that's that's something that is not just Star Wars, it's actually being um, utilized in some patients in, in some trials. So we're not there yet, but uh, we're moving in that direction. Because we just need to bypass you know, the damaged area. There's nothing wrong with the arm in someone who, who is paralyzed. It just doesn't work, right? So it's like a television that you unplug. Nothing wrong with a TV. It's, it's a fine TV, it's just not plugged in. So if we can somehow bypass the short in the electric circuit, we can plug it into the fully functional arm, we can regain function. So, you know, that's uh, something we, we really <clears throat> would like to have uh, available. Okay. All right, thank you for that. I'm gonna get into some uh, longer, some questions on access to care. I wouldn't say longer, but uh, a few questions on access to care. There's a okay. few people asking if they can watch this again afterwards. So the answer is yes, we video record we video record. We video do all these programs on purpose, okay? So that way you can see it over and over and over again. Share it with your family, share it with your friends, share it with other doctors, okay? Um, so everything that we do on virtual, everything we do in, in person is video recorded and we have our own YouTube channel. So if you visit the MS Views and News website, you can click on the link for YouTube or you could just go to youtube.com forward slash MS Views and News okay and you can look at all the videos we have there we have it segregated i guess you could say by different playlists of all the different types of like the virtual events that we've got going now so there's a tremendous amount of things there is like the doctor was saying before there is a there was even prior to COVID a tremendous amount of educational programs on there i think about 800 and now since COVID, we have over a thousand all right um we also every month we're doing a physical therapy program and we have a physical therapist trained for only ms patients that's online virtually doing events for us twice mm -hmm. a month the first program is learning new things the second program is what you have learned okay and she goes forward and teaches all this so you can find out about these programs also on our website as well as all the programs that are happening in april are already posted on our website is again it's just a tremendous amount of things there and I am going to go forward with the questions now, but I did want to get that out. It's fabulous. I'll just add that, you know, I have a number of new patients that come in and they go, well, I saw you on, um, you know, the YouTube and, and your talks sure. here and there. So, you, you know, if you you can utilize it that way and, and look at the talks of clinicians you're going to go see, so you kind of understand where they're coming from before you even go and see them. That's mm -hmm. right. Now, I'm stuck on certain doctors on the East Coast of the United States, and Dr. Legank has always been one of those that I'm stuck on using. Not that I'm stuck, I like him. I mean, you guys saw this presentation tonight. He is very detailed. And so that's why we like to use those that give a lot of information. And and um, it's for the benefit of those that are watching. So, you know, before I go forward with the last three questions, I just wanted to say that to you. And uh, now we will continue, all right? Just three more questions to go. Actually four, I missed one. All right, let's go to the one I missed first. How to communicate more effectively with assisted living administration who does not care anything about residents that have MS? Yeah, that's a toughie. Um, you know, you can lead a horse to water sometime and, and some people are very stubborn and, and not willing. Um, you know, the, I guess you could try to enlist your healthcare team to you know, just um, write something that might strike a chord uh, with that person and remind them why they're doing what they're doing. They're in an assisted living to help people who need help that can't, that aren't able to live on their own necessarily. And 
maybe we should be sensitive to the needs of that population and that's why they're they're in that job hopefully and if not maybe that's not the right job for them of course you know say that right away but um but maybe you know having family members just somebody um to kind of bring that up in a, in a kind way because you know you, people get defensive you're not going to go anywhere with that so uh Otherwise, you look for a different assisted living, and if they're just not willing to be accommodating or, or compassionate, then you know, that's sure. maybe not the right place. Sure. Thank you for that. I'm going to add in also, you could always contact a social worker and see if the social worker will intervene because they know how, they know how to speak to these people. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, they'll, they'll learn about, you know, everything that you might need and, um, and take it to that person or that person's boss, you know, and they can do that, but you may not be able to do that without getting too excited. All right. All right. Next, um, access to care. Uh, why does it take months for a new patient to receive the first appointment? Recently <laughs> diagnosed with MS, how do I know when to go to the hospital for treatment? I think we've already asked that earlier, but additionally, there are no MS neurologists in the local area, Frederick, Fredericksburg, Virginia. So do you have anything that you can say towards that? Uh, one is maybe your primary care person or whoever diagnosed you, you're not the only person they diagnosed or treated with MS and they may have a pathway of what's worked for them and, and patients who've had a good experience in getting their MS taken care of. Um, otherwise, you know, you may have to venture a little bit out, especially a first visit to just kind of get everything in play um, and then somebody more lo locally can kind of interact with that that specialist and and be able to implement if they're willing to implement and um, uh, work with the person that you go see the specialist that you go see um, but i think it's important um, you know first diagnosed to really get on the right track and and also have your questions answered um, sufficiently so um, if there's nobody there you contact the local again local ms society and say who, who are the providers in the area that treat ms because they they often will have a list of people who treat ms in the area um, and who might be ms specialists and uh, and then ask ask around other people from fredericksburg who who have ms if you um, if there's a support group or where do you get your care what do you find good about this or that um, it's it's can be challenging but i, I would say that you may have to take a little venture, at least for a first visit, to uh, kind of get plugged into the MS system. <clears throat> Great, thank you. All right, here's an interesting question that uh, many ask, and and that is how to effectively communicate that things are due to their MS, that they may not be able to stand on their feet all day and work, or they may not be able to get to family functions or to run out with the friends or whatever else. Do you have any anything that you can tell people that are you know, um, having a hard time talking with others around them that just don't understand. And um, so that way they don't feel like they're, that this person is just trying to make excuses. Yeah, um, it's really evident when we're dealing with fatigue and, and you just don't have, um have it in you to, to be able to go and enjoy those types of events. And people, some people don't get it. And, you know, Having them look at some of these programs that we were on tonight and what Stu was saying, the thousand other programs, there are some that may resonate. You know, if you just say, hey, I just wanted to watch this video that uh, a lot of times we as spouses will not listen to our spouse, but someone t says the exact same information and we go, oh, that's a good idea. And then the spouse elbows you because you uh, you said it was a good idea and they'd uh, come up with it before. So sometimes hearing, you know, if that person that you're you're with um, see someone else talk about that exact same thing and understand why fatigue is so devastating and they need to rest up and thought that they're trying to get out of doing something um, that can be helpful for that individual and and then just the bevy of, of resources that are out there about MS and fatigue and and such that you can print off if they're willing to um, to look at that and take the time and say hey you know I, I love spending time with you it's just that just that just shoots me with my energy and I'm not very functional and I feel kind of like I'm not productive during that time. And then the next day I'm shot and I've, I've lost out on that and I can't help provide in, in the house and make your environment better and kind of turn it in that direction sometimes is, is helpful. Um, some people just don't listen and they don't want it. They don't care to listen. And that's very, very unfortunate. But um, those would be the ways I'd try to get them to see. All right. Thank you for that. I had one more question, but now I have two more questions, right? Um, one person in rural America is saying that 
neurologist prescribes anti-CD20 antibody to JCV patients, says to see GP for any side effects. GP says see neuro for side effects. <laughs> this is going on in a rural community. So the there's no internal doctors and the GP has limited access to resources and they bounce around from doctor to doctor with nobody really knowing what to really say. What can you say to that person? <clears throat> well, I think that if there are adverse reactions to a medication that I prescribe or the MS specialist prescribes, they should be available to deal with that situation. So, so we should take ownership of that. Um, on the other hand, if a person has, um, you know, bellyache and has been having diarrhea or constipation and maybe not MS related or drug related, um, a lot of times the MS specialist gets saddled with taking care of all of the primary care issues that have nothing to do directly with the MS or the treatment of MS. And so the MS specialist says, go to your primary care physician, that's not a primary MS thing, or go get screened, or if you're remote or rural and you're having some worsening of your MS symptoms, some old worsening, typically what we'll say is, can you go to your primary care and, and have the urine check to make sure you don't have a bladder infection? Because a lot of times people are unaware of a bladder infection with MS. The, the signal that goes to the brain and says, I have a bladder infection gets impaired by MS. So they don't have any you know, realization. It's not burning, let's say, or they don't have the typical symptoms. But a lot of times that's the problem. That's what's causing the issue. So if you could go locally and just get checked out with some labs, then that can help to um, lead to the best treatment and not unnecessary treatment. So sometimes there's that communication where we'll say, you know, I think that needs to be evaluated or eyes on by the primary care. What would be ideal is if then we would call the primary care office and say, hey, Mrs. Jones is having this issue. Um, we think it would be most appropriate to, you know, test this and this is just to rule out that um, before we engage in treating uh, with steroids or doing something else. So that would be the optimal way is that they're not oppositional, but they're kind of cooperative in that, hey, if it's a, if it's a symptom, a side effect or something, I prescribed, I need to try to help manage that. But if it's something I'm not sure of, I don't know that it's primarily MS and, and going locally to get something taken care of may really lead to your best outcome. You know, that that would be the way to work that out. And hopefully they'd, they'd interact. And it doesn't have to be physician to physician. It can be nurse to nurse in the clinic if you explain what the situation is. So hopefully they'd have some collegial interactions that way and, and come up with the best solution. Okay, great. Thank you for that. <clears throat> I have to ask the audience, don't keep asking questions because I don't know how to say no and <laughs> that I'm not going to ask them. All right. And we could do this all night. All right. So I'm just going to ask you to stop. All right. <laughs> now, now, here's another thing I just want you all to know. One of the reasons why I thought it was very important to video record everything is for me, I've got, I've, I too have multiple sclerosis for those that don't know. And I've got what they call CRS. If you don't know what CRS is, it's I can't remember stuff. I'll say it like that, all right? I can't remember stuff. You can put whatever S word you want in there, but for me, it's stuff. And so I had a video record these programs because how else was I going to remember what I wanted to remember so that way somebody comes along that's asking right now about fatigue and depression, how am I going to ever be able to say, um, you know, go listen to Dr. Legang? Well, I can't. So, you know, we type in, we put in keywords with with a lot of what we do on on our YouTube channel and we could easily find these things. I'm just telling you this because it's a great channel to look at, all right? But um, yes, a Stephanie is asking, and this will be the last question I take online. Um, so my fatigue could be due to my depression, not my MS? It, it certainly could be a major contributor to your fatigue. Now, like I said, most people with MS have have fatigue. So some of the fatigue likely is from the MS, but if you have um, untreated uh, depression, fatigue is a major aspect of, of depression. So treating depression well often will improve that, that part of the fatigue difficulty that you have. And then, as I mentioned earlier, and you can go back and look at it, there are a lot of other uh, contributors to fatigue and you wanna make sure you optimize uh, treatment of that to, to uh, treat the fatigue. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, I forgot what I was going to say. See, I got CRS and I can't remember. Oh, so for anybody that was offended that I said your name, 
there's more than one of you in this world with your name, all right? If somebody was named Aloysius Gadiddlehopper, I would not have said your name, okay? Because that would be way too unique, all right? <laughs> all right. So, um, so going forward, um, you know, I believe for me, I've lived with MS since I've lived with MS. I've lived with pain since I've been a little child. All right. We I was not diagnosed till I was 39. But I've always offset my pain by like if if my finger or my toes were hurting or you know, I got this sharp pain, I got this tingling sensation that doesn't go away. Lemites, which is just like a constant for me, it doesn't matter. Anytime I've never I don't think I've never had Lemites, but I just offset the pain with another pain. So if I want to I smacked the table. <laughs> that makes me forget about my neck pain because <laughs> now my hand hurts, right? He has arthritis in his hand from repeated trauma, but that's okay. all right. All right. So that's that's for me, though. All right. And I just I had to say that. So, um, you know, it's, um, you know, sometimes we do things that we don't need to call somebody and say, how do we get rid of this? All right. Just find another way to 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 vent. I mean, it's you know, we live with this. All right. And we're going to live with it our entire lives because it's not just going to get um it's not just going to people text me funny <laughs> um it's not just going to disappear on us right now it's um you know let's get rid of COVID first and then we'll really worry about what's left with the ms but um you know there are those with uh, with ms that have very severe cases and i'm sorry for that but um but there are ways for us to live and go forward and we have to all right um we all have to do what we have to do to go forward with our lives. And boy, you can be inspirational. I mean, really, honestly, if you the more difficulties, struggles you have and the more perseverance you have and the smile you put on your face and and you do the best you can, just that moves people. And I, I, I can't right. tell you how many people um, monthly come into the clinic and, and address that exact point that, boy, that person really pick me up or somebody came up to me and said, I really, you know, made their, their day better by, you know, going to church, for example, despite having a lot of difficulties, just the presence and, and doing it was uh, moved other people to be better in difficult situations. So, sure. you know, do the best you can keep, keep working at it. That's right. That's right. There are times I'm walking down the aisle in the supermarket. I see somebody with a long face and I have to stop and say, you know, give them something to smile about and they're very thankful for it. So it's, you know, even if they're behind a mask, I could still see that they have a long face. So, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. So anyway, I think that's it. We're going to wrap things up. I do want to thank you again for being on here. I do want to thank everybody that is online. We, um, we, you know, we started off at uh, 5 30 PM central time. It is now just past 7 30 PM central time. And, um, and, <clears throat> We had a great show. We had a great program, right? You will be able to look back on this when we do get it published to our YouTube channel. We do send out an email to everybody that was registered for the program, and you could take that information and do whatever you want with it. All right. Um, you can you could use it to your benefit. You could use it to the benefit of those around you, or you could just delete the email. Okay. Um, I won't see it, so I really don't care. <laughs> all right. So anyway, I'm just giving you something else to laugh about and. Um, and I uh, want you all to have a great night. Dr. Legank, I will speak to you soon. And um, again, thank you for being here and taking time out from your family. We do greatly appreciate that. And as they say in the other worlds, namaste, have a great night. And um, everybody, we look forward to seeing you with our next event, which is a week and a half from today, okay? Thank you very much. Have a great night. Good night. Bye-bye.